following us on Zoom. So the first presentation is by Stefan Hartmann, Antje Quick, Nicolas Koch, and Claudia Maria Riel. So we have here Stefan and Antje today presenting. Yeah, the floor is yours. So 20 minutes plus five minutes for discussion. Perfect. Thank you. So uh, welcome everyone here in the room and also welcome everyone uh, at home. Um, so if I look weirdly to the slides, then I'm actually looking to the audience at home because here's the camera. Um, so we are talking about language attrition in a context variety of German. Um, and I'm going to present it, but it's, uh, as uh, Anna already said, joint work with Antje, who is also here, uh, and with Nicolas Koch, and especially with Claudia Riel, who actually collected all the data we are drawing on. Um, and I will first talk a little bit about Blumenau, about uh, German in Blumenau. So what you see here is like the filterized version of uh, this uh, language content variety. So there are like uh, bands and stuff uh, singing in German. Um, and then we present our case study, no pun intended, on dative markers, and um, we end with some qualitative observations. Okay, uh, so where are we uh, going geographically? Um, we are here in um, Blumenau in Brazil. It's um, a little town named after a pharmacist, actually, Hermann Blumenau, who was one of the first um, emigrants uh, or immigrants there. And um, what happened there is that um, in this little uh, city in Santa Catarina, Brazil, with about 300,000 inhabitants, um, it was founded in 1850 by German settlers and um, because the German settlers, there was uh, there is still German as a heritage as a heritage language to a certain extent, um, and uh, there are a couple of factors that influence language maintenance and loss in this area, not only in this area but also generally. Um, so, but particularly in this area, it's interesting that uh, settlers founded German schools and German cultural centers. Um, German. Uh, as a classroom language was then prohibited during uh, World War II, but reintroduced um, in the 1980s. Um, and there are optional German lessons today in elementary school since uh, 2005. And there's now also a bilingual Portuguese German school since uh, 2018. Uh, so there are some endeavors to uh, keep the heritage language kind of alive. Um, and if we take a look at this variety, we see a couple of interesting transfer phenomena. So we see a couple of lexical transfer phenomena from uh, Portuguese. We see a morphosyntactic transfer. Um, we also see a broad drop, which, however, also occurs in colloquial German. So it's a, an open question whether this really counts as a transfer phenomenon. Um, but the same also goes for the other things that we will look uh, at later on. So what we want to do in the long run with the project we are currently involved in is that we would like to disentangle different factors uh, that are uh, involved in the varieties development across generations. So um, disentangling language contact phenomena from other factors, also language internal factors that lead to developments within the contact variety. Because such language islands like German and Blumenau are a really interesting kind of uh, laboratory for language change because we have a, a language that is surrounded by another dominant language and that is uh, kind of cut off from other speakers of the language to a certain extent, although it really varies from individual to individual, uh, to what extent uh, they are in contact with uh, other German speakers in Germany, Switzerland, Austria, and so on. Um, but uh, as I said, that's really um, kind of a laboratory for language change uh, and also for investigating the influence of language contact on language change. And we would like to figure out which features of the minority language are uh, more robust than others and why, and also compare uh, the development of Blumenau German with the development of other contact varieties of German, and not, ne uh, not necessarily only limited to German, but, other, but also to other contact varieties of other languages, of course, because there are also um, 
for example, Italian language islands in the same area. And it would be interesting to um, compare the developmental pathways here. So um, what we are going to focus on today, uh, we had language attrition in the title. We can debate whether this is a good term or not. Uh, but uh, for many of these context varieties, it has been shown that we see things like a case loss, which is what we will deal with in our case study. Um, so, and this can be linked to the general phenomenon that it has been said that language context scenarios often entail uh, simplification. There are a couple of counterexamples, but in general, that seems to be a trend. And for example, Christian Benz and Bodo Winter have shown that, uh, for example, languages with many L2 learners uh, tend to lose nominal case. There have been all sorts of studies linking, um, for example, the number of speakers with um, and, and network density and things like that with uh, complexity. And uh, so there seems to be a link between um, the structure of the speaker network and uh, complexity versus simplicity, uh, and also things like simplification, of course. So the overarching, overarching questions that we would like to address uh, on the one hand, can we detect an increase uh, in case syncretism across the three generations of speakers that we have in our data? And also, are there specific contexts in which case markers, in our case, dative markers, um, disappear particularly early or particularly late over the course of development? Um, so Claudia Riel in a forthcoming paper argues that the loss of dative marking can already be witnessed in uh, the first generation of speakers, but with considerable individual variation. And um, she also argues that dative marking occurs, especially in prepositional phrases with high frequency nouns. Here we present a small replication study of this uh, study by Claudia Riel with more fine grained variables that I will introduce in a minute. Before I do so, uh, for uh, everyone who is not so familiar with German, a quick overview of case marking in German. Um, so if we have uh, an NP like uh, der Vortrag, the talk, um, we could uh, turn this into the dative, then it would become dem Vortrag. We could uh, say it, uh, we could also say the boring talk, then it would be the langweiligen Vortrag if it's in the dative. So we have case marking both on um, the, the article and on the adjective in this case, and sometimes also on the noun, uh, but not in, in this particular case. Uh, and case marking in, in German is notoriously complex. Well, I don't have to tell you because uh, I think in uh, in Estonia, it's even, even more complex if I'm uh, informed correctly. Um, but we have uh, these six main paradigms. There's lots of case syncretism. So there are many, um, many duplicates basically in this uh, across the different cells. And in many cases, you can't distinguish, for example, nominative and accusative, um, which will become important later on. Um, and uh, if we take a look at the dative, there are only a couple of paradigms where we actually have clear dative markers on the noun. In all other cases, um, case marking is basically relegated to syntax more or less. So uh, case marking is either uh, done on the article or determiner or on the adjective. Um, okay. So now about our data, uh, we use uh, data collected by Claudia Riel during field research, and she interviewed three generations of speakers aged. Uh, so the first uh, generation was up to 85 years old, the second generation up to 50, and the second generation, uh, the third generation were uh, essentially children. And uh, the data were transcribed uh, using the uh, BAT conventions, which is uh, which stands for Gesprächsanalytische a transcription, so like discourse analytic transcription uh, conventions that are very common in, in German linguistics. And uh, there are two data types, interviews and elicited translations, but there's no systematic tagging or annotation yet. So we had to uh, deal with uh, raw data basically at the moment, uh, but with first rudimentary annotations for um, things like case marking, which I will talk about in a minute. 
Um, if we take a look at the distribution of dative markers, first of all, and uh, check um, where there are nouns, where dative markers are realized or not realized, we can see that uh, we see considerable individual differences between speakers. So uh, these are the individual speakers here across generations. And um, in all generations, we have one, maybe two speakers who do relatively much case marking, uh, whereas it's mostly lost for all other speakers. Um, if we take a look at different kinds of uh, dative marking, we see that uh, there are different different types of dative marking. So we could have something like uh, uh, "meine Frau," "my wife." Uh, in this case, it's like um, uh, it's like a periphrastic possessive marker that's very common in German dialects. Uh, "Meine Frau," "seine Familie," and here "meine Frau." Uh, would be an adnominal dative, uh, so it's uh, the noun that governs the dative, um, whereas in other cases it's a preposition that governs the dative, like gegen der Baum, against the tree, um, and uh, in other cases we have uh, verb-dependent uh, datives, like jemandem etwas ansehen, to, to look, uh, uh, to be able to uh, gauge something from someone, um, and um, we can see that the prepositional ones are the ones that are most robust, uh, whereas we have some verb dependent uh, datives in the first generation, but they uh, are completely lost from the second generation onwards uh, as well. Um, but we also have a lot of variability, even in the prepositional ones. Um, to investigate the factors that uh, are influential in this uh, case loss scenario, we um, took only the prepositional datives, not the abnormal ones and the verbal ones, and uh, ran a card tree analysis, so conditional uh, inference and regression trees. Um, and we used um, the data, uh, the, whether the data is not is realized or not as response variable and as predictor variables, we use uh, whether the preposition that we have is a mixed preposition. Mixed prepositions are the ones that can be used either with accusatives or with datives and uh, entailing a different meaning, of course. Um, then we use the gender and number of the head noun and the generation. And uh, we can see that actually gender and number of the head noun emerge as the significant predictors, whereas uh, other uh, variables, uh, I didn't mention frequency now, which were also included. Uh, interestingly, do not emerge as uh, significant predictors. Um, I will skip the variable importance analysis, which basically says the same thing. Um, so um, we see that it's that it seems to partly depend on uh, general number of the um, of the item, and so ultimately on the inflection class. Um, but uh, even though frequency or this the token frequency of individual types didn't emerge as a significant predictor here. Uh, we do think that frequency plays a role indirectly in the sense that, of course, different inflection classes differ in their uh, frequency. Um, then uh, here we see an overview of the different realized cases. So, uh, and what we see is in most uh, the case that is uh, realized in most cases where we expect where we would expect the dative is uh, the accusative or nominative, so that often can't be told apart because uh, in the case of feminines, we usually have the situation that uh, it can be both. Um, and in many cases, we see no um, case marking, but the, the accusative seems to become like the default case marker, which is also um, consistent with the case hierarchy that has been assumed in the literature. Uh, where we often see the scenario that uh, fine-grained case marking distinctions uh, collapse to a two-case system with a nominative and an oblique case, and in this case, uh, the accusative might be uh, might be on its way to become like uh, the only um, surviving case apart from the nominative. Um, here we see the most frequent realized datives, and it's, in, it's interesting that uh, they partly 
oops, wrong direction, sorry, that they partly overlap with the most frequent non-realized dative. So uh, the concrete chunks don't seem to play such a role. Um, it's more a case of um, individual variation. And um, our constructionist account of this scenario, of this uh, observation is that the language use of second and third generation speakers can partly be accounted for in terms of simple frame and slot patterns that are uh, abstracted from highly frequent word combinations. And uh, that also some highly frequent word, co word combinations like Indie Schule, accusative, uh, are available as fixed chunks and are therefore also used in contexts where we would expect uh, dative case marking. So overall, we can see uh, that already in the first generation, there's a loss of case marking. There's an overall, we see overall less case marking in generation two and three. Um, but we also see that dative case marking is retained in a few contexts, especially in propositional phrases, which might be chunks by some speakers. So there's a lot of individual variation. So uh, in future studies, we will have to focus more on this kind of individual variation and put the user in focus uh, even more. And uh, yeah, that's it basically. And I'm looking forward to your question. Uh, thank you very much. We have time for some short questions and for people on Zoom, if you have questions, please, uh, please write in the chat. So I will read aloud. Perfect. Hmm? Yes. Yes. Oh, that very nice, very interesting uh, presentation. Thank you. And uh, as we are a group from Lithuania, also working on on, on heritage language and language attrition patterns, it, it, it's really very in, in, interesting. So, why did you study dative? Uh, uh, I would suppose that uh, this is uh, the first uh, kind of uh, form to 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 be. Um, uh, um, <laughs> uh, uh, to to have this specific uh, you know pattern to 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 disappear or to to uh, to be overalized uh, over generalized by normative most probably I don't know whether you saw the trend that uh, uh, also other cases like uh, accusative as you said yep. might be also over generalized by uh, nominative exactly yeah so it would of course also be interesting to take a look at the the other cases. Um, and uh, we basically started with the data because it's such a salient phenomenon, not only here, but also in other context varieties of German, we often see data flaws. And so that was like an obvious choice for a first pilot study. Um, but of course, we also have to look at, at the other ones, yeah. Yes, any other questions? Anybody on Zoom? Nobody so far is writing. I think that. Oh, you have another question. Yes. Have it's very interesting. So you've mentioned bilingual schools. Does it mean that these are like uh, Saturday, Sunday bilingual schools, or these are normal education kind of uh, uh, institutions? Oh, I missed uh, kind of. Uh, um, I think that this new one is actually a regular school uh, where. Uh, pupils go to on a, on a daily basis, whereas the previous ones, these elementary schools, um, they would they just offered like uh, one or two hours of uh, German lessons a week or something like that. Uh, so, uh, but uh, this bilingual school enterprise it seems to be actually a, a kind of regular school as, as far as I know. But uh, I my knowledge is also like second hand knowledge, so uh, I've never been there and. Uh, that would be a question that we would have to relegate to Claudia, actually. Thank you very much. So the schedule is rather tight, and so we go to our next presentation by Ineta Dabashinskina and Laura Kamanduliti Merkelenia. Uh, so you will present for both. I will. <laughs> yes. So now we move to a completely different topic. This is the last one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. The lower arrow is next slide. Okay. Uh, dear colleagues, it's great to be here back in, in Tallinn, back to this conference. Um, and I'm very happy that uh, together with me, there are uh, uh, 
our center of uh, multilingual child language research and my collaborators, Laura and Ingrid is here and a little bit of second younger generations over there, but, uh, uh, and one of them are working on heritage language. So it's really great. It's uh, again, pleasure and, and thank you for inviting and, and, and accepting this um, uh, presentation. Um, so uh, the topic is on narratives on Lithuanian speaking monolingual and bilingual uh, children, both typically develop, developing language disorders and, and bilingual group. Uh, uh, the question, why do we study narratives? It's a very broad one, but uh, those who are a little bit in the child uh, research area, most probably aware of the fact that this is very um, uh, visible activity in, in, in everyday life of, of a family. So it is uh, very frequently observed in, in family settings, uh, later on in educational institutions, and children are already aware of uh, different aspects, how to, how to produce the narrative. Um, narratives supposed to be very important uh, skill uh, uh, in order to uh, achieve some uh, academic uh, results and also narrative show uh, linguistic skills. So it's some kind of uh, uh, method that can be used for very diverse purposes. Uh, and uh, we also know that uh, uh, in, in contrast to, to those who don't have specific skills in, in narrative production uh, might, might have difficulties. And those difficulties uh, are related to, to different issues, uh, might be because of the incomplete language acquisition, uh, again, because of different facts, uh, language delay, uh, specific language impairments, and it could be due to, to bilingualism or, or multilingualism. So, and uh, uh, we study uh, narratives in order to prevent. Uh, therefore, there are uh, many groups of children in, in our uh, sample of investigation. Um, so we know from the variety of data uh, of uh, monolingual typically developing children, even uh, delayed children, and also from bilingual population, that usually children start to uh, uh, utter the, or start to, to produce their first personal stories, or at least have a rudimental knowledge of, of, of narrative skills already uh, from three to five years of age. So this is a very particular age. Uh, and uh, we also know that uh, uh, the importance of study uh, narratives that I have mentioned before, due to a variety of reasons, it's already been uh, uh, demonstrated uh, by, by, by many colleagues, uh, presented in many uh, separate individual presentations, but also um, in, in uh, edited volumes like this one uh, presented here. Uh, so the main focus usually for narrative production or comprehension, but especially for production is microstructure and macrostructure and microstructure. So for macrostructure, usually we look at uh, the, the structure of the story, so-called uh, uh, story grammar. Uh, we look how children develop the uh, episodes, whether they have skills to complete episodes and, you know, begin the story and have the ending and, and this transit from the beginning and ending have uh, specific features. Additionally, we look at, at microstructure, which is uh, linguistic levels of, 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 the, of, the, uh, of the utterances uh, or, or of uh, different kind from for phonetics, morphology, morphosyntax, and vocabulary, of course. So uh, we, uh, we have uh, studied narratives already for Lithuanian, uh, and therefore these are the group of people who collected some data and, uh, and have um, uh, uh, produced some papers uh, using, again, different population of children, but uh, rather with uh, small sample sets. And uh, uh, we have decided to, to, to create a big corpora, 
uh, and to collect uh, all possible data uh, available already from our from our resources from our samples um, uh, in order to see what are the differences similarities uh, among different populations of young children so actually we were targeting we are targeting already from five to seven years of old again this age is very important uh, for like preschool to enter the next phase uh, of uh, very specific social environment in terms of learning uh, and also in terms of socializing. So for children, usually the age of uh, five, six, it depends on schooling, of course, uh, it's kind of uh, uh, entering into very new, new uh, uh, setting. So uh, for this big project, which started just uh, recently and will continue for two years, so we want to uh, to investigate uh, the uh, variety uh, of uh, data, meaning that we are uh, investigating three big groups of population of children of typically developing uh, uh, developmental language disorders and bilinguals. Um, and uh, we will see at this story grammar, macrostructure, and also of uh, linguistic levels. Uh, mainly uh, lexicon, morphology, morphosyntax. Uh, for uh, spe specific groups, we will look also into other details like bilingual population. Of course, they have uh, specificities like code switching, for example, uh, and so on. Uh, for this uh, presentation here, uh, we, 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 we have data for 445, 44 children, it's huge. And therefore, uh, as the colleague just before me, it's, it's like um, uh, it's still uh, the, corp the, the corpus have to be kind of harmonized. We are uh, having some, some, some troubles uh, sometimes to, to, to look and, and to connect the pieces and uh, in annotating and encoding. And so we have noticed some, uh, some even errors. So it's, it's normal in, in, in corporate research. So for this uh, um, very specific, as I said, um, uh, present, pre present, uh, uh, presentation, we, we will look only at very few parameters here of um, uh, um, micro-linguistic stru structure, meaning general productivity and syntactic complexity. These are broad uh, uh, kind of concepts, but uh, I will say in a minute. Um, uh, I would also like to, to, to say a few words about those three groups. So uh, as I mentioned, we have uh, typically developing children. Uh, here we have 169 uh, children. They inside, they also are divided into age group like five, six, seven. So there are still some, some, some grouping. And uh, the second group of children, uh, uh, this developmental language disorders, uh, more than 150. So these children were identified as having a uh, language impairment from specialists like uh, speech therapists uh, or logopeds. It depends how, how, how you call in different countries. So usually when we collect data, we um, collaborate with schools and kindergartens. We have special agreements uh, with the institution, but also with parents. We collect uh, uh, you know, consents from parents. And uh, um, therefore, um, especially for this group of children, we ask specialists uh, to identify those children uh, and uh, uh, provide for us, let's say, uh, as, 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 as um, the target group to, 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 to investigate. And we have a peculiar bilingual group uh, which is uh, uh, in total 152, but uh, we have uh, uh, Russian Lithuanian bilingual, sequential bilinguals, those ethnic minority group living in Lithuania. Uh, the data is collected from kindergartens of Kaunas and Vilnius, uh, most of you know, two big cities. Um, uh, this group, uh, uh, learning Lithuanian as a dominant titular language of the country. It means that Lithuanian, uh, they acquire Lithuanian as a second language. Um, uh, these children uh, uh, attending Russian uh, 
mon Russian monolingual, let's say, uh, kindergartens. Uh, both parents are, are, are Russian speakers. Uh, their home language is Russian. Uh, however, they have, uh, according to Lithuanian law, some hours during the week of Lithuanian language, which is not a lot. Uh, three, four hours of Lithuanian language during the week. Uh, however, we would imagine that uh, environment is 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 also uh, most probably social contacts uh, or, uh, also are a, at least some of them are Lithuanian. And the second group is Lithuanian English. So first language is Lithuanian. These are so-called heritage teachers, and uh, English uh, is uh, the dominant language of their. Uh, country where they live. So they, the, this uh, sample is collected from uh, UK, London, uh, and these children attend already English uh, schools because uh, the uh, education system uh, in, in UK uh, starts uh, earlier than in our country, so they already aware of specific uh, um, activities uh, uh, since uh, four or five years already. So they are familiar most probably with some uh, additional elements. They are um, using Lithuanian at home. Both parents are Lithuanians uh, and they also attend Lithuanian Saturday schools. So actually the data was collected from Lithuanian Saturday schools. So uh, as you see, of course, uh, we, uh, um, collected the data asking children to produce uh, narratives in Lithuania. So definitely, you know, the, the, the group, uh, the two groups of bilingual children is, is different and, uh, and the results were of course also different. Uh, so what did we do? So we uh, used the so-called the multilingual assessment tool for narratives. Uh, some of you are very well aware of it, uh, developed by Gagarina and, and colleagues, uh, and uh, uh, Lithuanian methodology tool uh, and the whole inventory was adapted, translated by uh, my colleague and, and, and me. Uh, and uh, uh, actually, uh, this is uh, one picture sequence that uh, we have used for, for this specific uh, elicitation, let's say. And uh, mm, uh, there are other stories. Um, uh, we, for elicit narrative, we can, we, can, we can use storytelling mode and story retelling mode. So this is storytelling mode and uh, 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 so-called baby birds. Uh, and, and we ask children uh, to, 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 to to produce, they were encouraged that each children um, was um, uh, invited to a separate room. So research uh, uh, had so-called small talk in order to uh, uh, to make uh, to familiarize the child with with the environment, with um, with each other, um, and uh, asked to to tell a story uh, according those uh, those 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 pictures. Um, uh, well, so just a few few more words about about the procedure of um, uh, of, of data collecting. So uh, usually uh, we used uh, uh, we using uh, child's like uh, uh, child's language for for uh, data uh, transcribing and 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 uh, coding and annotating. Uh, it's uh, it's uh, it's a system or program uh, very well known for child researchers and most probably others who work with spontaneous uh, language productions. Uh, this is a specific system that uh, allows you uh, to uh, to put in a right format, uh, but uh, differently from the colleague uh, with a keynote speech uh, about big corpora and how you can auto uh, automate the data. For child language, uh, unfortunately, this is not possible because of very individual, very many individual differences. So it's a lot of manual work, and uh, and also um, because of uh, of the uh, coding, uh, 
Uh, as I mentioned, this corpora of more than 400 is collected a little bit from different uh, uh, time slots, and 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 now we're trying to put everything together and harmonize. So. Um, uh, sometimes different research questions appear. So the coding is also uh, involved, although we have uh, this default coding for uh, uh, morphology, morphosyntax, but uh, when you work with bilinguals or, or especially in uh, language uh, uh, delay children, you, you have specific uh, markers. So uh, as I mentioned, first uh, we transcribe, we uh, annotate, and the work is not finished yet uh, and, and, and continues. Okay, so just very few fresh results, um, as, as I mentioned. Um, we looked at general productivity, which is the total number of produced words, mainly tokens, when you ask a child to tell a story. So what is the length of those stories of six pictures? So these are um, uh, typically developing children, uh, uh, dis language disorders, uh, Russian, Lithuanian, and Lithuanian English. We have decided to separate those two bilingual groups, as I said, due to very peculiar uh, language uh, production. So uh, they showed, uh, and you will see uh, some 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 differences. So um, uh, what 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 is obvious already that those children, uh, bilingual children, they produce. Uh, uh, much longer stories uh, than even monolingual uh, Lithuanian children. Um, so what was very interesting to look, because previous research of ours, we had very small sample, and we saw that trend. So now uh, it's kind of confirmation, it's nice results for us, that this trend is confirmed because now you have, you know, quite now hundreds of those children. So. Uh, the explanation is uh, most probably related to educational settings. Children in the UK most probably are uh, uh, encouraged to, to, to produce stories. Maybe this activity is started much earlier than, let's say, in Lithuanian schools or in Lithuania. Um, or they have this kind of free expression that the education itself is not that uh, strict, like most probably in, in some other environments. So uh, our hypothesis that it, it most probably have to be related with, with, with the system of education. Moreover, uh, it might be also the fact that they start schooling earlier. So it means that they have already like one or two years uh, advanced uh, uh, advanced. Uh, 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 kind of um, uh, perspective. Uh, uh, when we look at MLU, this is uh, mean length of utterance, like a, 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 the very default measure for syntactic complexity. So you also see that, uh, okay, uh, this is, uh oh, um, what did I do? You can help. <laughs> that, <Yeah>. okay. <laughs> uh, uh, that, uh, uh, both uh, this bilingual group and and multi um, uh, typical developing multilingual show rather rather same uh, same 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 result. What is also interesting, this is only uh, uh, distribution of frequencies. So uh, we did not look yet at statistical differences, but we now we checked uh, a little bit earlier with smaller but uh, still big group, that it is a, a, a statistical difference between those typically developing multilingual group and uh, uh, English uh, kind of bilingual group uh, in terms of the story length. So this is kind of interesting result. So uh, as we also see that uh, the other two groups, uh, language delay and uh, those who are uh, like uh, Russian uh, speaking children learning Lithuanian as a second language has uh, different results uh, and uh, the lower score, so called. Uh, for general productivity and average of words and narratives uh, within the different age groups, so we can uh, also have this. Uh, uh, um, distribution uh, and, and the age effect kind of uh, um, uh, picture. Well, a little bit um, uh, kind of tendency to show increased results and uh, 
and and um, you know with the age you would expect nothing nothing interesting but then uh, with uh, those uh, mm -mm -mm. other children uh, other children uh, especially again bilingual group sometimes demonstrates uh, 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 what you would not expect um, and MLU, again, in narratives, uh, very nice uh, growing uh, um, line for typically developing children, even with language disorders. I don't know. <laughs> I, I, I'm pushing the same button, but <laughs> maybe too hard. So um, it's also nice, nice uh, lines that growing up. But with bilinguals, it's like a little bit of... Um, uh, of uh, 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 deviation let's say from from what you would expect then uh, we uh, don't have a, a clear answer yet but uh, but uh, i will say in a minute and for syntactic complexity we had a very preliminary idea to to look at something else again very very fresh criteria the number of predicates and utterances so what you see here so again for both lithuanian groups not not by, by, by bilinguals, but multilinguals. So uh, the number of uh, utterances with one predicate, uh, it's decreasing, showing that the syntax is getting more complex. But with bilingual groups, especially this one, we do not see. But uh, in, in other words, you see that two groups uh, are also very different. And again, this bilingual population needs a closer look that it's hard to explain why, why it is so. So uh, very, very, very short and very fast uh, what it appears. So we need to look uh, deeper and dig deeper because uh, very many uh, children, um, as I said at the beginning, we kind of uh, try to look for the trends and tendencies which in some um, uh, in, in some in, in some uh, 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 pictures you could also observe like a little bit of growing or, or going down or showing that the tendency towards more complex which is uh, realistic and it should be the way that children are getting older but this especially for bilingual group uh, we have uh, uh, a lot of uh, uh, ideas what to do next but one thing is very clear that they are very heterogeneous um, and uh, uh, within age group we see also that uh, some children could, could produce a story from only 10 uh, very very few words let's say and the others up to 70. so uh, this heterogeneity makes uh, studies of bilingual population very difficult but also interesting so we also think that even though you, we know that you cannot uh, compare much monolingual and bilingual population these days, are, are, it's, it's very clearly emphasized. So therefore we are kind of separating and we will be separating two uh, mon bilingual groups and uh, mon typically and non-typically developing group. And we'll look for, let's say, each population, what is authentic in each population and in any, uh, what, uh, what, what are the specificities. But in, in, in any case, uh, it's a long way to go, uh, you know, 400 and even more, more children. So we are here with a very fresh result. So sorry, nothing most probably interesting, but uh, as a small language and country with this big data only for narratives, I think it's, it's nice. So thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. One short question. We have to be on time. One short question. Yeah, with the first. Sorry. Um, thank you very much. Uh, just a question concerning, you know, different measurements that you're doing. So, for example, uh, you know, different measurements concerning lexical variation. I mean, just, you know, the number of words is one thing, but uh, you could get various differences if you, for example, have type token ratio calculated. Yeah, um, we, we did. I, I just deleted the last minute because it, <laughs> because it was a little bit confusing. For type token ratio, it does not show in this small sample uh, uh, any specificity, it's especially for, for uh, lexical diversity. You have to look at lemma token frequency. Therefore, otherwise you will get kind of gra grammar parameter. Lithuanian is very rich uh, morphological language you you have a lot of forms you know those types so it's 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 really confusing so um, uh, when we 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 decided just uh, you know but with lemma you need much more coding uh, 
And we know that already the, the, with, with small samples that we did, we did uh, for content words, noun and verb, uh, 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 lemma token, or, or let's say um, lexical diversity countings, and we also did for functional words. So it's also very interesting how this uh, uh, how how this kind of type of of, of different uh, uh, words are presented in children, whether they you know, and and uh, um, additionally uh, content analysis is very interesting. Like to look at the examples that you can also see interesting stuff. So, well, thank you very much. So this is uh, as much time as we have for this presentation. Sorry, this is the schedule. So the next speaker is Annette Ross. Yeah, so I will already start when this is uh, happening. So I'm talking about uh, Roma community in Estonia and uh, about uh, um, their multilingualism, I'm trying to map the languages that are used in Estonia by the Roma communities. And uh, also this kind of different uh, alt language alternation patterns. And uh, well, the broader aim is that like those who research multilingualism, live multilingual life, uh, we all know how how diverse it can be, um, but then again in Estonia, we, we often... Yeah, very diverse. We have the uh, annual elevator testing today. They just ah, walked they in. Did. Good, that this is elevator okay. testing. <laughs> uh, yeah, <clears throat> so... Uh, yeah, uh, so just to show how different diverse, diverse situations, yeah. yeah, how different communities use uh, languages, uh, and also here in Estonia, where there are multilingual uh, communities. So who are we talking about? Um, so Roma community is a minority community of around seven hundred um, Roma officially, and unofficially the estimates are around uh, one thousand and five hundred. Uh, people uh, here in Estonia currently two Romani dialects are spoken so they are uh, Latvian and Russian Romani um, but uh, the speakers also self-identify as uh, uh, Estonian Roma and uh, here on a the map you, there are these bigger and smaller dots of Roma living in Estonia according to the official statistics and these are people who have self-identified as Roma in the census data um, what is important is that Roma do have a lot of connections over the country borders. So Latvian Roma have sort of continuous connections to Roma in Latvia, uh, although they have been here for 200 years. And then also to the Russian side, there has been a bigger migration um, during the Soviet times and that kind of migration continues. So we have some speakers, but some Roma who migrate for some time to Finland, the UK, Ireland, France, so on. So it's kind of dynamic community with a um, with a lot of um, influences from different regions. And then you can see in the in the south, in the city of uh, Valga, there here it says around 100 Roma. Well, it could be around 350 Roma right now, and uh, it's a border town. So the education services, everything is accessible in Latvian, in Estonian, and in Russian. Um, so that's why when we take a look at the languages that are spoken by Roma, it, there are quite some. So again, the statistics comes from uh, Statistics Estonia, uh, official statistics, it's self-reported. And uh, uh, there are no specifications how well someone can speak language, if they can write or speak, and so on. So Romani is only oral uh, language in Estonia, it doesn't have a written standard and written forms are only used uh, for personal communication. So we see uh, more than 85% of Roma speaking Romani and also Russian, so very common languages uh, spoken in homes, also Estonian, and those who are familiar with Estonian population, you can see how Russian and, and Estonian uh, play a role in, uh, depending on the region, so how much it's used in Roma families. And then Latvian, which is both the family ties, might be one of the home languages, and then uh, might be also the language of education. 
English comes as for everyone um, from education for younger generation, but also um, due to migration to the UK uh, and Ireland and then um, coming back. And there are also like Latvia and Roma from Latvia migrating to the UK and then uh, migrating after that to Estonia, to Valga, um, because of easier access to better education and social services. And then with Finnish, the official statistics are quite low, 7% of Roma reporting to uh, know it to some extent. But um, there is an active um, a missionary work uh, from Finland. So a lot of Roma in Estonia actually have contact with Finnish speakers because uh, the home language of uh, Finnish Roma is usually Finnish. Um, and Estonian and Finnish being closely related languages, they often try to interact um, in Finnish and Estonian. So it's used quite much more uh, by the speakers. And when we talk about Romani, so um, it is influenced by all these content languages that, that are present there. So I named it as there is no pure Romani. Um, it's that standardized, a lot of variation. So here is an example of a speaker whose task is to tell a narrative in Romani. Uh, she's recording it alone, just by herself. And this is what she produced. And the switch to Estonian is sort of for me, just saying like, oh, sorry, I made a mistake. Uh, I continue so you know you can edit it if you want to use this tape as um, a tape. And the other um, text, is what we could see as Romani. It's just that it has this Latvian influence, Estonian, Russian. Um, and uh, uh, so what happens before this Oi Sorry, uh, sorry is that the speaker uses Estonian stem verb, Estonian word verb for color, um, integrates it into Romani. So it has a Romani feminine ending. Uh, and then wants to self-correct and one of the reasons is that when it's more of more uh, uh, sort of formal situation then Estonian Roma tend to leave Estonian borrowings as the last thing to take so it's sort of most informal uh, language to use is to use Estonian and you can see this krasa um, that is then correct this is the Latvian form so that is uh, that is what happened um, and Roma in Europe, in the world, are very often um, at least bilingual, multilingual. Uh, it means that they very often speak Romani, uh, knowing another common language. And uh, this creates like what Matras has called bilingual modes, so always knowing there are these other resources on the side. And as well, social linguistically, like Romani is in this situation where it's usually not in official education, it's not standardized language. Mm -hmm. Um, and just living um, in the middle of other uh, languages in different countries, it makes Romani uh, speakers plurilingual. So my approach here um, now, how to sort of make sense of this mix of languages and these patterns that we will take a look at, was to look it through the perspective of translanguaging. And I know that translanguaging can take another, <laughs> uh, another day for us to uh, sort of uh, pain point, but for me, uh, the focus is on the linguistic ability um, on this using the full repertoire of languages, as you could see from the previous example of what is Romani. So it can um, be influenced a lot uh, by the local languages and also the agency that it gives to speakers so that it's not sort of stable mixed code or stable one kind of alternation or three kind of alternations, but that there is very much diversity in the speech. Uh, and my data comes from uh, recordings that uh, are done either by me or uh, fieldwork assistants uh, who are of Romani background. And uh, here are just a few of these combinations of languages that are there in the recordings. It's quite a small corpus. It's around 10 hours of recordings from 10 different speakers, mostly females. Um, and um, uh, and yeah, I, I have less 
speakers who are fluent in Latvian, so it's more focusing on Estonian, Russian, and uh, Romani. There are narratives and there are spontaneous con conversations, and it's in no way sort of a very authentic um, dinner table conversation of Romani, because already recording Romani means that it's something that is very staged for the speakers. It's very different um, than using Romani just in the community. And the first example here is when a speaker um, is telling a uh, about their own experience working in the NGO. The idea was to have a bit more formal recording of, uh, of what has happened to archive it for sort of the next generations. And um, you can see here that the yellow is uh, so switches to Russian. And this is again what I mentioned earlier that although the speaker is fluent in Estonian, Estonian is not the first choice um, when there is a gap in Romani or, or, um, or feel to emphasize something, but it's Russian. Uh, and uh, this is what we could call sort of a formal, uh, formal Romani for some speakers. Then here is a conversation between four women um, who all previously know each other. And it's a talk about like where um, three, um, like where the father of, the, of this family was born. And you can see that all of the speakers switch between Romani and Estonian, but it's sort of utterance based. So it's, it's not that we switch to one language and then switch it back, but it goes quite, um, quite intensely. And then what happens at the end is like, let's go on with the recording. Like now tell us about this uh, uh, soup that you, uh, you, you know the recipe well. And uh, the woman starts to say, yeah, I take meat and does it in Estonian. And then as the recording is for recording Romani, uh, so there's another um, participant who says, speak Romani. And then the speaker uh, continues uh, speaking Romani, repeating again, I take meat. And overall, like before this excerpt and after that, the conversation goes on mostly in two languages, so mostly Estonian and, and Romani. And, it's, and these are, and Russian are the home languages um, for that family and these relatives. So it's very common for them to use all three languages um, as something that's spoken at home. And now um, a bit longer uh, narrative from one spontaneous conversation where we then see how Romani and Estonian are alternated by uh, one speaker and um, Already in the beginning with we see that although it's all gathered, gathered, um, it's Romani, um, it's the same word, but it's just uh, that the stem is first Estonian, then Latvian, uh, as well as this lupati, like racks and kaltse, which are Latvian and Estonian. Uh, and then person switches, uh, switches back, switches again, switches back. Here is Patom. Um, that I marked as Russian, it could rather be seen as Romani. It just, um, it might not um, activate any Russian for a speaker um, when this comes, because there are these um, different, as well as the speaker uses conjunction and uh, in as E, as Russian one, but it's throughout, um, it's, it's in her idiolect. It's, it's um, the only form that she uses. And as we go on, um, another um, longer narrative from a spontaneous conversation. Here, uh, also the speakers knew each other but uh, from earlier, but they are not so close. So an older speaker is telling a story of like why things are as they are right now uh, in the world. And uh, this speaker also adds parts in sort of what we could call uh, Russian, so in Russia, with Russian morphology, not integrating it uh, with uh, Romani morphology, like Rukavajit, um, and uh, um, 
this like uh, using verbs um, in Romani without integrating them um, into into Romani is quite common also in in Russian Romani as well in Finnish Romani from Finnish. Uh, so this is something that could also see a very sort of usual part of um, of uh, Romani, uh, like when speaking Romani. Um, but we also see a, a bit more uh, switching. And uh, just to show like that it is a communicative act. It's just like I tell you something and maybe you make some sense of it. So at the end, um, the speaker asks, uh, like, didn't you know all of that? And then the other um, person in the conversation continues, of course, I knew all of that, that you just told. Um, so this was a, a, a natural a way of speech for them. And, uh, uh, and yeah, as, as like for the conclusion, um, I would like to show it. There are these different languages here. We now looked Estonian, Romani and Russian, but the same way like Latvia may be, might be one of the languages that is um, is alternated. Um, there is a high vari variety, um, and I wouldn't say that I see some kind of mixed code that is sort of that way. But even for Romani, like when we see how the Romani is spoken, there is so much variation just from the influence of Estonian, Latvian, Russian. So the speaker okay, is all the time actively choosing what to use. And um, what also is important that uh, Latvian Romani speakers and Russian Romani speakers, they do have different uh, resources, um, linguistic resources. So Russian Romani speakers usually don't understand Latvian and they don't understand, they understand the Latvian borrowings uh, in Romani, in Latvian Romani speech. So they are also used to take into account if they can actually speak Romani with those Latvian borrowings or if they can't. Um, so that's what makes Russian a good choice um, to, for resources because uh, most of Baltic Roma can uh, understand Russian well and it's sort of a lingua franca for this region. And uh, yeah, um, I mean, here I, I still name the languages as languages, as Estonian, Russian, uh, Romani. But you can see that there is a lot of variation. Estonian and Russian does not mean a standard Estonian and Russian. There is that kind of uh, um, of diversity in, in every language and also uh, more archaic forms uh, that are spoken uh, by Roma. Um, yeah, thank you. So there are a few references. Thank you very much. So we have one question here and people in Zoom, if you have questions, please write in the chat. Um, yeah, and you have the next, yes. Yeah. something fascinating. Um, the, um, the nature of words that are sort of preferred to be uh, inserted. Um, do you have any analysis in terms of the part of speech that's being preferred? Because I've noticed that two groups had emphasizing adverbs, which is normal in English, they come uh, on the third, fourth uh, word um, of the clause. And then there's a lot of time related adverbs as well um, in Russian. And so we have this really and even, daje, mm -hmm. yeah, and then we have a dom. Discourse markers, I'm sorry. This is a whole, it's, I think we have to discuss it separately. It's a whole topic uh, about, uh, you know, copying of discourse markers in language contact. It, it, it's, a, you know, there's huge literature about it. So I, I think that this is a topic for you to consider separately. My, yeah, absolutely. And I, sorry, I, I wanted to the supervisor here. <laughs> I wanted to make a comment that actually I, I sort of, so I work more with only Romani um, morphology and so on earlier, then I understood that I, when I'm talking about uh, uh, the actual language alternating patterns, then first I sort of mapped how, which languages are spoken, which was this, and, and why they are spoken and in which domains. And then I moved into how these languages are then used. So I haven't um, reached that part. But in Romani, it's very common yeah, for utterance modifiers to be mm -hmm. from contact languages. Um, and we see this kind of change also here that 
the Latvian ones and Russian ones are step by step um, replaced by Estonian ones when it's more informal speech, as as well as uh, uh, there is this hierarchy of conjunctions. What are borrowed first? So we see that we also already see also Estonians replacing there some of uh, Latvian Russian ones and Polish ones. So there is this sort of degree of how how where we use which language so where Estonian enters um Romani. Yeah. And there was yes, please. Uh, you show the example of this uh, Latvian uh, borrowings uh, that is uh, like the 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 the, 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 the root existed in Russia too. And you mentioned that the Lithuanian is not very popular among other Roman uh, speaking people. So is it uh, is it uh, often is it uh, is it a tendency uh, to use uh, Lithuanian words that also Latvian Latvian, Latvian, Latvian not Lithuanian. Uh, good question. I I know that I I have not um, uh, I have not been exposed much to how speakers speak Romani with uh, like Latvian speakers speak Romani with Russian um, Roma. So I hear their own perspective on that, and often they say like, yeah, you know, you have to um, to switch all these languages from <laughs> from Latvian to Russian. And I think in this case, like, of course, if the meaning is uh, delivered, then it's fine that it's uh, uh, Latvian um, that is understandable for a Russian speaker. But it seems that Latvian, Roma, and Estonia are way more used to um, taking into account how other Roma are speaking um, than Russian Roma, because they have had a bigger community and they also have less contact languages, because usually Russian Roma in Estonia speak Russian. And then might uh, speak some Estonian additionally. Anything else? Anybody else? Yes, please. Yeah. Uh, so you mentioned that uh, getting uh, interviews was complicated. So can you sort of explain how we sort of how you can approach with them? Uh, yeah, so it's uh, another uh, story with 10 years of history. So I have worked 10 years with the Estonian Roma community. Here, Roma don't really want to share their language to outsiders. It's an inside community language. It's a secret language. So I always um, look what we can research or do. Where are the limits? So I have data from those speakers who are ready to share it. Some of them would like to have like have these folk tales written down, published in Romani with translations. Others say like there's no way we're ever gonna translate anything. Um, if we have, we only have it in Romani. So it is a very complex um, topic, and and it's it's a very sensitive one. So from those speakers, I have asked if I can use these excerpts from the recordings. Thank you. Yeah, I think anything else? If no, then. Uh, well, we have some technical things to do. Yeah. So, because the next, so thank you very much. And if the, we have the next presentation on Zoom, and I hope everything works. Yes, Natalia, can you hear us? Yes, yes I can hear you. Can you hear me? Can you see me? Nice. 
So okay. our, our next presentation is by Natalia Sierreta, and it will be on Zoom. Yes, yeah, so then people will be those who would like to ask a question, so please ask loudly. Yeah, so because we have a microphone here. Okay, shall I start? Uh, wait, uh, just a second, do I have some? Okay. Now you can, I, I will switch the slides from here, so. Okay, great, yeah, I, I'll be giving signs uh, once we yeah. the slides. Uh, okay, good, so I'm going to present an analysis of my study on vlogs conducted in frames of my PhD research project. Uh, I'm a first year doctor student in linguistics here at Tallinn University at the School of Humanities. Uh, my PhD research concerns the phenomenon of code switching, which is one of the common outcomes of language contact. Uh, in this case, uh, the language for is Egyptian, Arabic, and English, and the collected material comes from blogs. Vlogs or video blogs are kind of uh, electronic journals published by the authors, here the authors being Egyptian women um, on YouTube on their public channels. Therefore, uh, the material is available uh, for everyone to watch, unless, of course, it's it's banned in a country or something like this, but here is not the case. So now we'll change the slide, please. Slide number two. Um, so I'll first talk about the research goals for this study in particular, as well as uh, for the whole PhD project, uh, as this here is the base for um, the analysis here. Mm, the, the, the material analyzed here is uh, the base from a first article in terms of an article-based dissertation, hopefully. And secondly, I'll explain the method uh, used for the analysis and the theoretical framework behind it, as well as say a few words about the data and the participants. Uh, then I'll discuss the um, social linguistic situation in Egypt, specifying which varieties of Arabic are spoken there, which one exactly is under analysis here, uh, as well as the place of uh, English language in Egypt. Uh, after that, we'll move to the research outcomes with examples, uh, with examples illustrating the, my findings. And finally, if time allows, I'll shortly summarize what has already been uh, done and what the next steps in my research will be. Uh, I know there'll be five minutes for discussion at the, at the end of my time slot. So if any questions arise, uh, please let us leave them for that time. i will be happy to answer all of them or at least attempt to. Um, Right, so let's start with, with the research question. So it's slide number three. Let us move the slide, please. Thank you. My PhD project concerns the phenomenon of code switching, as I already said, between Egyptian Arabic and English in vlogs. Uh, so for this uh, research, I decided to only focus on female speech. So there will be no male vloggers uh, whose content would be uh, analyzed here. Um, but apart from that, the participants' profiles will differ between each other, which may also influence uh, their language choices and the differences between them. Uh, so all the YouTube channels that the material comes from could be described as lifestyle profiles. Uh, however, the topics that are being discussed there vary. Uh, what I'd like to present here is the material collected from our first article concerning language choices in product review videos. Um, the product that the products that are being reviewed are mostly books and cosmetics. There's also one film review. Uh, so the research goals that I developed for the whole PhD project as, uh, are as follows. Uh, the first one concerns the main types of code switching occurring in the material uh, using noise and pathology. So uh, the possible types were insertions, alternations, conversationalizations, and ethnic backflagging. Uh, the second question question is an extension of the first one. Mm, to our congruent lexicalizations, indeed, absence was very rare in this language pair, as I did another study on this language pair. Uh, the third one uh, concerns um, the frequency of code switching, how often does it occur, what could affect this frequency, uh, everyday communication versus login performance. Uh, and the last one um, is about possible reasons for this phenomenon, also extra linguistic um, reasons. In this material, the most common type uh, of code switching detected uh, were insertions. Also, some examples of congruent discretizations were found. And for the study in particular, I developed two research questions. Uh, what categories of words, what uh, parts of speech are being replaced with English equivalents? And are these equivalents, are there equivalents for these words or expressions in uh, MSA, ECA? Uh, MSA stands for Modern Standard Arabic and ECA for Egyptian Colloquial Arabic. Um, so now I'd like to say just shortly about the terminology I'm using. So code switching um, is employed as an umbrella term here. 
uh, and could be replaced also with code mixing, language mixing, language switching. But here uh, I'm using only uh, only code switching. So the main point is basically that two languages appear in one iteration and they come into contact with each other. And now we change the slide, please. So it will be about data and methodology. Yes. Uh, I will start speaking already if it's fine. Okay, good. Um, right, so in my research, I'm applying a qualitative method, uh, which consists on a detailed analysis of individual language use, while also attempting to find language behaviors common for all five participants. Uh, as already mentioned, I'm applying my typology of code switching in order to classify the detected uh, switches. Uh, in order to provide a unified study of language change, I'm um, using the user device approach, looking at the same time at the, the cognitive and social components of the speech, so in order to combine general and social linguistics. Uh, the data comes, um, it consists of five hours of video blogs published by the five different content creators in 2022. Uh, so this gives approximately one hour per person. And the fragments where code switching occurs were manually transcripted by me, and I will present some examples uh, in one of the next slides. Uh, so here for this presentation, I use a simplified transcription. Uh, this, this means that the long and short vowels are not marked. Uh, however, I will when I will read them, uh, this, this will be uh, hearable, uh, hopefully. Uh, right, so we change the slide uh, again. So this is slide number five. And here you can see the participants' uh, profiles with a few information about all of them. Uh, so I added this information of whether the vlogger covers her hair or not, uh, as this may uh, be an indicator of who their intended uh, audience is, which may affect language choices. Um, so this is uh, my idea based on my um, background in Arabic and Islamic studies and kind of knowledge of, of the culture as well that uh, hijabi was the one who, um, very long story short, uh, cover her hair, um, they uh, are most probably uh, targeting a female audience. So one of them is vlogger number, um, number three, as in this special playlist only for married women. This material is not being analyzed here, uh, but just to, to give you an idea of why this information may be relevant. Uh, they themselves, the vloggers, do not say anywhere uh, that this, uh, apart from this, this series uh, only for married women, they do not say anywhere that this is only for women or only for, for men. Uh, so this is, uh, well, my idea, but I think it, um, it, it may be relevant. I actually believe that. As an important indicator is, in my view, the expat experience, as it definitely uh, shapes the speaker's linguistic repertoire. Uh, even though there's there's definitely there's no one pattern uh, for all for all expats uh, in the world, and then the number of followers is simply to give you the, an idea of how different the level of login experience among the participants may be, um, and so how how this may also uh, affect uh, the language choices. Uh, so two of them have over uh, one million followers, and there is one who only has. Um, less than uh, 400. Um, the numbers come from uh, the beginning of April, so I have not checked them uh, yesterday or today, so it, it may already be a little bit more. Good. Uh, I wanted to say a few words about the social linguistic situation in Egypt, uh, so if I might ask to move the slide again. Um, so this is the slide number six. Um, so even though the study concerns uh, Egyptian Arabic specifically, a closer look at the general linguistic situation in Egypt uh, is needed. Um, so the official language of Egypt is Arabic, meaning modern standard Arabic, uh, MSA, uh, which is a modern, uh, and saying modern, I mean, uh, it is meant uh, slightly simplified in terms of grammar and also with, um, with so-called modern uh, terminology, so words naming new technologies, which are not uh, present in, uh, in Quran. Um, so it's a modern version of classical Arabic. Classical Arabic stands for uh, Quran's language, Quran, meaning the Holy Book of uh, Islam. Uh, so MSA um, being primarily a written language uh, that is nobody's mother tongue. So uh, this is also important to other lines, nobody's mother tongue. Um, there is a variety of spoken dialects uh, throughout the country. Uh, so now in my study, I'm using the term ECA that we have already seen, uh, Egyptian colloquial Arabic. And what I mean here is the dialect of the capital, Cairo, 
um, there is uh, there's another group of dialects in the south of Egypt, but Saharidi, and then in the west, um, in um, around Siwa Oasis, uh, there's another variety, uh, very different called Siwa Arabic. And so these are not being discussed here. Um, so this was mentioning that the whole spectrum of MSA, ECA um, may be heard in, um, in blogs and in different kind of formal and informal language uh, settings. Um, so sometimes this uh, this line between um, MSA and ECA is not that visible. I'll get back to it also a bit later. Um, so as I will show in one um, in one of the next slides, uh, even though uh, this focus point uh, is focus point is cross switching between Egyptian Arabic and English, there's also another language per here in the material occurring, MSA ECA. So now studies on Karin Arabic have suggested that women may be more likely to use more MSA in their speech than their male interlocutors, especially in more formal settings. Um, so it was observed, and my observation confirmed it as well, that they tend to pronounce the MSA uh, sound po, po, more often. Uh, so now just to give you um, an idea of <laughs> what I mean right now, um, in Karin Arabic, uh, it is pronounced as a glottal stop, so it's a. So on the, on the example of word kahwa, uh, which means coffee, uh, in Cairo, Alexander or Pusarit, you would say ahwa. Uh, and then in Southern Egypt, so I mentioned the Saridi dialect, it would be gahwa, so ga. Um, right, and then investigating uh, the phenomenon of code switching between Egyptian Arabic and English, it is crucial to understand the role of English in contemporary Egypt. Uh, so during the 70 years of British colonization, Egypt, uh, English was next to Arabic, uh, one of the two official languages. Um, and then around uh, 30 years after regaining its independence, uh, within, um, with, uh, with the beginning of Anwar, President Anwar El-Sadat's um, presidency uh, and its open door policy, English started again in popularity, which is uh, which is to be seen also today. Um, so it's knowledge guaranteed and guarantees um, until today a much better paid jobs uh, than positions with only uh, Arabic, model standard Arabic. Uh, so regarding the education system should be taken into consideration that it's not homogeneous. So there are public, religious, private, international schools. Um, in some of them, in private national ones, uh, English may be the language of instruction, uh, which means uh, an immersion uh, from um, from childhood already, and then in public religious ones, uh, Arabic is language instruction, and English is only one of the subjects. Um, so this touches already the topic of the level of English proficiency among Egyptians, uh, which depends a lot on the exposition to the language, um, and then some children may attend already kindergarten instruction with instructions in English, um, not to speak of different FO, FOP, so family language policies, which here we, we are not able to, um, to to get to know what what kind of uh, exposure did uh, my participants have. Uh, so when it comes to analyzing these video materials published on YouTube, on the internet, it is um, impossible to determine what linguistic background that informant have unless they share. Uh, it themselves. Uh, so now it's slide number seven, uh, and there are already the findings. So I found the informants use English nouns when naming um, beauty, skincare products, as well as their ingredients in otherwise monolingual ECA sentences. Uh, English was also used for uh, topic related terms, uh, topics being um, beauty, film, uh, films, uh, books. Um, as I already mentioned, most of the code switching occurrences are insertions. In the material, also some congruent lexicalizations and these cause switching pragmatic markers were detected. Um, regarding colors and numbers, these were given both in Arabic and English um, without a visible pattern, at least uh, for the moment being. An interesting occurrence was giving the same word or expression twice or more within one utterance. Um, again, it was uh, there was no pattern, uh, it, whether it was given in Arabic or in English first. Um, so, um, yes, and then one of the participants, uh, the first one, uh, the one with more than one million followers, um, was vividly um, more often switching to English when uh, performing the vlog in a smaller group. So she would sometimes invite her friends or another vloggers from, uh, from the Arab world, not only from Egypt, and then when they would um, 
address the audience, they would uh, automatically uh, speak in English, even though uh, their audience uh, would usually be from the Arab world because the, the videos are primarily in, in Arabic. Mm, and then I also mentioned the tendency to switch between ECA and, MC, and MSA and the uh, more standard pronunciation. So two out of five uh, participants um, tend to uh, to pronounce uh, cough um, in, in almost every possible word. Um, for my observations show for now. Um, and then uh, with the other ones, it was not that uh, often. Uh, good, let us move to slide number eight with the examples. Been looking at the time. Um, all right. Uh, so the first example shows a um, uh, discuss switch marker, a pragmatic marker, actually so actually my flight, my flight is in two hours. Um, and in the second one, uh, you can see the use of uh, the same expression twice in one utterance uh, in both Arabic and English. Excuse me, so excuse me guys, excuse me, so just excuse me. Um, and here's twice, excuse me, excuse me, guys, excuse me, my, my bed is not my yet. Um, then Ashan Sha'arik al Curly, you can say it, you have to be because in order for your curly head to be happy, it needs to be moisturized. Um, and so here, this uh, curly, uh, this is only uh, English element, uh, is, um, is, is fitted um, into an Arabic construction. Uh, so uh, your curly hair, Sha'ar, uh, Sha'arik. Uh, we've got the possessive uh, pronoun uh, your k uh, at the end of the word shard, mm, and then l curly. So the adjective needs to be uh, defined um, by the the, the um, definite article al uh, shard l curly. Um, the next two examples um, show uh, a word that is uh, that is um, not. So easy to say whether it was said in Arabic or in English. Uh, it's the word film. Uh, so film in English and then film uh, with long E in Arabic. I mean, the first example, um, I would say it was the, the Arabic uh, pronunciation of film, illustrating style film, so the name of the film. But in the second one, in the Mish Film Critic, um, the construction film critic is, um, my opinion, at least uh, purely English because in Arabic um, you would say the critic of the film um, or critic film, uh, film being an adjective. So it would be uh, or filmi, uh, or uh, even um, even if you would say it in English, but within an Arabic uh, structure, it would be a critic of the film. Um, so it's also not, not always um, obvious whether the word used is, uh, is Arabic or English. Uh, and in Wadi in low production, uh, it's clear that he, so the film meaning is low, low budget production. Um, and the, the last of the examples here, kind of in the attitude. And so I, um, I have the attitude. I apologize that I made a mistake here. And I in the attitude uh, means uh, I had, I did have uh, the attitude. Um, okay, uh, I have one more slide. I can see my uh, time is uh, slowly uh, reaching its end. Um, so uh, here I wanted to uh, to show um, some of the English switches. Some of them appeared in the examples uh, on the previous slide with its possible Arabic equivalents. And these are um, examples because uh, usually there are more ways to, uh, to, to say uh, a word or an expression uh, in, in Arabic. That, for example, is actually I, I chose the fil or uh, fil whereas there would be at least two or three uh, more and more options to say that. Um, yeah, um, good. I think I'm, I'm slowly um, reaching the end of uh, what I primarily wanted to say. Um, if there are already any questions or comments or anything, then uh, when I'm here. Or also, also the last slide. Yes. So I hope you could, you could hear me uh, well and it was understandable what I was trying to uh, to communicate. Thank you very much, Natalia. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, this is fine. So thank you. 
uh, we have some time for questions, but please come just in case, come here and or ask loudly. I will see whether we have anything on Zoom. Oh, so you're welcome to ask. We have five minutes or so. I apologize for the sounds in the background. You know, we hear you perfectly well. Good. Well, Good because there are some. Well, in here. that case, if nobody wants to ask anything, so I will start. Uh, I will just, well, it's not a question, but it's, again, it's a suggestion that you could um, consider discourse markers or utterance modifiers separately because mm -hmm. uh although i don't know arabic i think that uh something well as far as discourse markers are concerned something is going on but from yeah, those definitely. examples yeah so it is so you see what happens so we we just <laughs> heard about romani yeah so it's a very common thing so do you think that there are more English discourse markers than just what you have attested so far. Yeah, definitely. Also, uh, studies uh, on this language pair, but in different language settings, like in everyday communication, show that a lot. And uh, there are other um, researchers, uh, they distinguish um, discourse markers as, um, as a separate um, group. So, so I definitely uh, consider that as well. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. So something for future. Uh, yeah, 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 uh, definitely. Anybody, anything? Well, if no, so nobody here. Uh, yeah. So thank you very much. Thank you. And so far, so good. Everything is working. Okay. And I hope, yeah, and we are on time. So we have lunch in, I think it's on the third floor. Uh, near the room where we had plenary talks talks and then we reconvene here at two o'clock